I'd like to welcome you all to the Ohio Family Engagement um, Leadership Summit. We are glad that you could join us on this day of professional learning meant to take family, school, community partnership to the next level. My name is Alicia Willis, and I will be this session's moderator. This session is session four, Attendance Matters, addressing early school absenteeism for success. If you have any questions, concerns, or technical issues, please message me privately in the chat. And to ensure that all get the most out of today, we ask that all participants turn off the webcams and microphones. If you have questions for the presenter, please use the chat feature and I will pass them along at an appropriate time. You can also join the conversation on Twitter um, by using the hashtag Ohio OH Summit 23. And I just put that into the chat. And I'd like to introduce you to the presenter of this session, Arya Ansari. He is an assistant professor of human development and family science in the College of Education and Human Ecology and a faculty associate at the Crane Center for Early, College, or Early Childhood Research and Policy. His research program investigates how contextual factors influence the early development of children from low income and minority homes. Through his work, he seeks to identify effective interventions and policy um, recommendations to bridge the opportunity gap in the United States. I will now turn it over to Arya. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you all. Thank you for that kind of introduction and thank you all for making it out today to this uh, conversation. Uh, so as mentioned, let's see if I can get to the next slide. There we go. We're going to be talking about uh, why early school attendance matters and why we really need to be thinking about this in the earliest years of school. So in terms of the agenda, I want to begin by talking very briefly about why we need to focus on the earliest years of education um, and with respect to uh, the, the core issues in the United States and why then focus on preschool absenteeism. We'll have a conversation about why children are absent, what the outcomes of absenteeism are, and then we'll talk about some strategies for addressing absenteeism, and we'll conclude and have uh, some time for more in-depth Q&A. So in terms of learning objectives, uh, there are three key ideas here for today. Uh, we're going to first explore factors contributing to absenteeism. Uh, we're going to understand the consequences of school absenteeism, and then we'll learn strategies or brainstorm strategies uh, for addressing this issue. So with that in mind, let's jump in. Uh, I want to begin by uh, asking you all two questions. Uh, we're, for these two questions and for uh, a subsequent question, we're going to be using mentimeter.com. Uh, so if you have your phones, you can pull it out, uh, open up your cameras, scan the QR code. Uh, that will directly take you to this poll. Or if you're on your computers, you can type in menti.com. It'll ask you for a passcode, and you can just enter in 675745. Uh, but the question I have for you all today, or what I want to get started with, is uh, how many days do you all think it's acceptable for a child to be absent from school in a year? Uh, response options will range can range from zero, um, and the max being every day with the average school year being about 180 days uh, the, as the cap. So uh, if you can take a moment uh, and enter your responses, um, we'll see where we end up with, uh, with what folks think. I see some responses coming in. Um, we have, okay, I'll give you all an, uh, another 30 seconds, 40 seconds to complete this. Okay. We're seeing a pretty stable estimate. Um, folks can keep uh, entering in their thoughts, but what we're seeing is uh, folks think that it's okay to miss about seven days um, out of a 180 day school year. Uh, and there is, is a range, but that range is not that wide. There's um, estimates of zero, and I can't necessarily tell what the top is, but it, the, the cap is where the highest response is based on this chart. Um, but it's not that high in terms of the, in terms of what the uh, maximum people think is okay to be absent. So I want to now add a little bit more context and uh, ask you all whether your answers change uh, when we're talking about preschool versus high school. So 
does it is it okay for children to miss more time from preschool versus high school so does your prior answers change and as you're responding to this you can think about whether there are different standards uh, for consideration uh, and this is just simply a yes no poll uh, if you have the the app still open it should automatically show you a little um, thing at the top that says go to new slide and if you close out you can again just uh, scan the qr code or type in menti.com same passcode as before We'll let the responses trickle in and we've got 34 respondents and right now it's like an even split we're at 50 50. give folks another 20 or 30 seconds to trickle uh to, to enter in their responses we're, we're getting a slightly we're getting a 53 47 split right now most people are saying they're roughly half of people are, are saying their answer would not change and half of people are saying their answer would change okay uh, very interesting you can continue adding in your responses here um and this is something a theme we'll revisit towards uh the end of this conversation that we're going to have um and i'll provide you with some data as to whether it or not it matters at least empirically speaking uh, but very cool. I appreciate you all taking the, the opportunity to answer these questions. And with that said, we'll put a pause in the mentee polls and sort of delve into the problem and why we really need to be thinking about the earliest years of um, education. And the problem is that many children are struggling school as they enter, are struggling as they enter school for the very first time. Uh, we know estimates vary from community to community, uh, but a, a local estimate here in Columbus over the last few years suggests that upwards of three in five children are not ready for kindergarten in, in critical areas of literacy, social skills, math, and physical and motor development. So that's about 60% of our youngest learners who are unprepared in these critical areas. And it's not just that all children have an equal likelihood of not being ready for school. We know there are uh, serious inequities in our communities and, and in society more generally. Uh, across the income distribution, for example, we know that the most disadvantaged children in this country enter kindergarten up to 22 months behind in key areas of early language and literacy skills. And I want that to sink in for a second, right? At the age of five, when most children are starting kindergarten for the very first time, there's already roughly a two year gap between children at the bottom end of the income distribution relative to the top end of the income distribution. A two year gap at the age of five. And this is truly concerning because we know once children fall behind as early as age five, uh, it, it's hard to catch up. It is hard to catch up and they oftentimes continue to stay behind throughout their educational careers. And this is perhaps not surprising given the nature of brain development. We know that 90% of a child's brain develops or happens, that development happens before the age of five. And I'm not trying to create a false dichotomy of uh, birth to five and K through 12, uh, but rather what I'm trying to illustrate or underscore is that those early years, and those early years of education represent an important point of intervention and prevention. And it's these ideas, right, in recognition of the opportunity gaps that exist in this country and in our community and the nature of development that has promoted the premise of preschool, which is that every child in this country, regardless of background or culture, will have access to a highly effective preschool program before they enter kindergarten. And there's not necessarily a la there's there's not necessarily a uniform definition of preschool, but for the context or for the purposes of today's presentation, what I'm going to be referring to when I mention preschool is more center or school-based opportunities. And when I say highly effective, when I think of highly effective at least, I think of certain elements or certain essential elements, such as the inclusion of effective curriculum, which allows teachers to lesson plan and guides day-to-day -day practices. It includes high quality teacher-child interactions because we know that more emotionally supportive, instructionally rigorous and organized 
classrooms or organized teachers make a difference in the lives of our youngest learners. And these programs also have a trained workforce. And that's reflective of the fact that more educated and experienced teachers also make a difference in the lives of our youngest children. And of course, it's gonna require exposure to these programs uh, for an extensive amount of time, right? These programs need to be provided to children in sufficient intensity to close gaps that are upwards of 22 months. And the premise or the promise is if we provide it based on decades of empirical evidence that children who have the luxury of attending these programs will enter kindergarten more ready to learn than those who do not. We know that graduates of preschool enter kindergarten demonstrating stronger academic skills, such as counting, letter word identification, and have greater vocabulary skills. Recent evidence also demonstrates cognitive advantages, such as working memory and cognitive flexibility. And under the right conditions, we know that graduates of preschool also may demonstrate more optimal social skills. So uh, better interactions with their teachers and classmates. So the promise is that children will enter kindergarten more ready to, le to learn as a function of preschool attendance. And the cherry on top is that under the right conditions, enrollment in preschool can help minimize achievement gaps that exist in this country. Will it close that 22 months? No. But is it a piece of the puzzle? Absolutely. Unfortunately, the, this promise is oftentimes, we oftentimes fail to deliver on this promise because of inequities in our communities. Across the country, you find that 66% of children who are considered to be middle class or of higher income from higher income families, about 66% attend preschool in the year before kindergarten, relative to only about 51% of children who are considered to be low income or in poverty. So there's a 15 percentage point gap in access. And if families are lucky enough to get into a program, we know there's also inequities in access to high quality programs. We've seen in different communities in this country that uh, only 4% of children in, in rural areas have access to high quality teaching across the early years of education, as measured by the instructional rigor, the emotional supportiveness and the classroom organization. And that children living in poverty or in high poverty communities are over twice as likely to experience ineffective instruction in preschool, again, as measured by the instructional rigor, the emotional supportiveness and classroom organization. So there's inequities in access and there's inequities in access to high quality programs. But if a family is lucky enough to get their foot in the door and getting their foot into a door into a high quality program, uh, we know there's also inequities in who can show up on a regular basis. Children from low income and historically marginalized communities are at the greatest risk of being absent from preschool and classified as being chronically absent which means that children miss so much time from school uh, that it adds up to be over 10% of the school year. And for those of you who might not be as familiar with this term, what chronic absenteeism includes, it includes all excused absences. It includes all unexcused absences. And it also includes any suspensions. And you add those three buckets together and that results in chronic absenteeism if it is over 10% or more of the year. So chronic absenteeism is a child missing school for any given reason when it totals over 10% or more of the year. And I know you might be thinking to yourself that, you know, this is not an issue in the, this might not be an issue. You might be thinking to yourself, it might not be an issue in the earliest years. Why are we talking about preschool? This is more likely to be an issue in middle school or high school. And, you know, that's kind of what's portrayed in popular media and movies. Uh, but that is a misconception. And I want to show you all some data from the city of Columbus uh, to highlight what I mean. So I'm going to show you all a bar chart. Uh, Y-axis corresponds to the percent of children who are chronically absent in the 21-22 school year. 
Uh, so ranging from zero to 100% of children in Columbus City Schools. And then on the x-axis, what we have are our grades, ranging from preschool all the way to 12th grade. So what we find here in the city of Columbus is that 74% of children in preschool are chronically absent. 74% of children are missing at least 10% or more of, of instructional time. Three out of every four children. And this isn't, I want to emphasize, this isn't a Columbus thing. We see high rates in other communities as well. But if we're thinking of Columbus, what happens as we start looking at the other grades? Well, as we focus in on the elementary school years, or what some people deem to be the elementary school years, K-5, we see that estimate drops by about 15 to 20 percentage points. Chronic absenteeism rates are in the 55 to 60 percent range. As children transition to middle school, we see a slight uptick to the 65, 70 percent range. And it's not until high school where we see chronic absenteeism rates that approach the levels or exceed the levels of chronic absenteeism in preschool, where it ultimately peaks at 12th grade. So what this shows is that chronic absenteeism isn't something that just happens in middle school or in high school. No, this can be traced back all the way to the first time, or one of the very first times, children step foot into public education. And for those curious, the, these numbers that I'm presenting here uh, for Columbus are roughly three to four times higher than state and national averages. So, Thus far, what we have talked about are sort of why, number one, why are we talking about the earliest years of education or why are we focusing in on preschool? And, and what is this notion of chronic absenteeism and why are children chronically or how frequently are children chronically absent? Uh, I want to take a moment for us to jump on to menti.com again uh, or Mentimeter and I want to ask you all a question. You'll have an opportunity to answer three different times. I'd encourage you all to keep it to two or three words uh, at most. But what I want you all to answer is why are preschoolers so frequently absent? Um, and I'll give you all a moment to start entering your responses here. So in particular, why are preschoolers at the high, why are the chronic absenteeism rates so high in preschool relative to uh, for example, K-1-2. Uh, and your answers will uh, enter into this word cloud uh, that we can sort of see. And the bigger idea or the ideas that more people are endorsing will uh, be sort of the larger font. And let me close out of this so we'll have a, a bigger window to see. Okay, so we're seeing things like illness, transportation, parents, I see not a priority, schedules. Give folks another 20 seconds to answer this question. Not seen as urgent, half day. more play-based. Okay. Unknown importance. And we've got 91 responses. This is great. Um, I will let folks keep trickling in their responses, but this is all very important parts of the conversation, um, in large part because there's not a great answer to 
why children in preschool are more frequently absent relative to K-12. So the ideas you all are presenting are, are excellent ones. And the question is, the, the issue is there's not as much data we have to be able to answer this question. Um, but uh, my colleagues and I have been interested in trying to shed light on this issue to the extent possible. And I want to share some of that information with you all here today. So uh, let's keep in mind what some of the key themes were, uh, including illness, transportation, not required schedules, guardians, things like that. And now let's sort of see what the data says. And before I show you all what we have found, empirically speaking, I, I want to talk about very briefly how we oriented our or conceptualized the reasons. Like, there, as you all pointed out in the earlier slide, there is a whole host of reasons. Uh, and so what we tried to do was think about how we could bucket these, these, these reasons, and we bucketed them into three broader factors. The first of which is family circumstances and necessity. So uh, how many adults might be in the household to be able to help out? Whether parents were employed, uh, income, other sources of child care availability, the receipt of social support. Our second basket or bucket was family stress and routines with the notion that stress and instability may be associated with greater rates of absenteeism. So things like food insecurity and inadequacy of medical care. Issues with health or health stress, both of, for parents and children, both mental and physical health. Exposure to neighborhood violence. And day-to-day -day routines, such as how frequently children are getting sleep and whether they have regular sleep schedules. Our third bucket was more oriented toward what centers or schools and classrooms could do to help curb absenteeism. So the frequency of home visits or parent-teacher meetings, the types of services provided to children and families, such as medical care, transportation, which a number of people were pointing out, thinking about classroom factors such as uh, the the interactions with teachers, whether teachers are emotionally supportive. How frequently other children in the classroom might be absent with respect to establishing norms. And then at a more basic level, whether parents and children feel welcome and enjoy coming to school. So our question was, to what extent do family circumstances and necessity, family stress and routines, and these center and classroom practices predict children's rates of uh, chronic absenteeism. The data we use, uh, which is to date one of the few that exists to answer this question, comes from the Family and Child Experiences Survey of 2009, which is a nationally representative sample of Head Start or first time Head Start attendees, uh, uh, including over 3,300 children from all states in the District of Columbia uh, from about 500 classrooms. So we use these data to answer what are the predictors of chronic absenteeism? And so what did we find? I'll begin with the necessity factors. And for those of you who might not be familiar with Head Start, uh, it is the largest federally funded early childhood education program in this country uh, that serves children in poverty and uh, children who are uh, of low income from low income homes and communities. So with that said, what did we find? Uh, what we found was that those necessity factors didn't consistently matter, at least among this sample of low-income children or children from low-income homes. So things like household structure, income, again, at least among this sample uh, from disadvantaged communities, other care availability and social support were not consistently associated with absenteeism or chronic absenteeism. The main exception to this necessity factor was when parents received greater social support from other parents, so when their social networks in their children's schools were larger, and when mothers were employed uh, for more frequent hours per week, uh, their children were more likely to show up. But in the main, those necessity factors weren't key predictors. 
What we did find, though, is that stress and routines matter a far greater degree. So experiences with food insecurity, inadequacy of medical care, poor health, fewer hours of sleep, irregular sleep schedules, experiences with neighborhood violence, were all associated with elevated levels of absenteeism. So whereas those necessity factors weren't as key in predicting chronic absenteeism, we find that stress and routines among this Head Start population mattered a far great deal more. And on the positive side, we also found that classrooms and schools do matter. When centers and schools provide more services to families, such as transportation and um, medical care, when classrooms were of higher quality, when they were more emotionally supportive, when children enjoyed coming to school, when parents felt welcome coming to school, they were more likely to show up on a regular basis. So what this snapshot at the national level among uh, the segment of preschool attenders and Head Start suggests is that these necessity factors weren't as big of, of a driver of school attendance or chronic absenteeism, but stress and routines mattered. And there are key things that schools and classrooms can do to help with this issue. So pairing that with what you all said found gives us a portrait of the different reasons why children might be absent. Uh, and I want to acknowledge that a lot of the reasons you all pointed out in, in your uh, mentee polls in the word cloud are, are very important. And unfortunately, from a data perspective, we just don't have that those kinds of questions that get at those indicators or uh, aspects or for those reasons why kids might be absent. So there's just a lack of data to be able to answer the reasons or questions you all are bringing to the table. But it's very important for continued consideration. So thus far, we've talked about why the early school years, frequency of this issue with respect to absenteeism and chronic absenteeism, and why kids might be missing school um, or being classified as chronically absent. Now I want to talk about, does this actually matter? Does it matter that children are, are missing time from preschool? Believe it or not, Preschool attendance is one of the best predictors of absenteeism in elementary school. So whether a child shows up on a regular basis at the age of four is, 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 key, is a key indicator of whether they're going to show up on a regular basis at the age of five, at the age of six, at the age of seven. It begins to establish these habits and patterns and routines for both children and their families. But it doesn't just affect future attendance. It also has consequences for children's readiness for kindergarten. We have found that when children are more frequently absent from preschool, they do less well academically. They demonstrate less optimal mental health in terms of uh, externalizing and internalizing symptoms. And they demonstrate less optimal interactions with their teachers and peers. And you might be thinking to yourself, okay, well, there, there are these associations. Being absent is predictive of less optimal achievement mental health, but does it actually make a big difference in children's outcomes? Well, the work we've done in preschool suggests that chronic absentees, again, missing 10% or more of the year, those children fall behind in areas of math and language and literacy by two to three months. Schools are give or take nine months, right? It is essentially, what we're essentially talking about is chopping away two to three months of those learning opportunities, which is not a trivial amount by any stretch of the imagination. So there is a sizable consequence. And these Outcomes of absenteeism, uh, what we have found is it further amplifies existing inequities in our communities. I want to show you all what the, what the white-black opportunity gap looks like. 
in the areas of math, language and literacy, and cognitive flexibility, which are represented on the x-axis. And I'm going to show you what these gaps look like in terms of the magnitude, which is represented on the y-axis. For children who were infrequently absent in the earliest years of education, which will be in blue, and then children who were frequently absent, which will be depicted in red. So what we find is that when, ch when, when children are infrequently absent from school, the white-black opportunity gap in this country uh, amounts to about 0.2 to 0.4 points, which is modest in magnitude. What happens when children are frequently absent? That opportunity gap increases by one and a half to three and a half times. It jumps to 0.4 to 0.6 points. So absenteeism or missing time from school is further amplifying existing inequities that exist in our communities. And it's not just as if, you know, I'm absent this year and, you know, I do less well this year and then my slate is wiped clean for, you know, the next year's school. It, it doesn't work like that. Work we've done suggests that there are long-term consequences of missing school. So although missing school isn't predictive of engagement in risky and deviant behavior in young adulthood. What we have found is that when children are more frequently absent from school, uh, they are less likely to be employed in young adulthood. They are more likely to experience economic hardship. They are less likely to have been civically engaged. And they do less well in school, both as measured by performance in high school in terms of their GPAs, and in terms of pursuit of post-secondary education. So missing time from school has a far reach into children's educational careers. It doesn't just stop at the end of a school year. It kind of has this snowball effect over time. And so one of the earliest questions I asked you all was whether your opinions of the number of days missed from school would be different if it were talking about preschool or high school. Although there isn't necessarily data to answer that specific contrast of preschool versus high school, we have been able to test differences between preschool kindergarten, kindergarten first grade, all the way through the end of middle school. So we have contrast between preschool and eighth grade. And we have contrast between missing time at the beginning of the year, the middle of the year, and the end of the year. Right. And what we consistently find is that it does not matter whether children are missing time at the beginning of the year or at the end of the year. In preschool or third grade, in third grade or eighth grade, missing school matters. And it matters in the exact same ways. So this, there's, so this notion of it's just preschool doesn't actually hold when we're talking about what the data suggests. Every day missed is an opportunity missed for learning. So we've talked about now why the early years, rates of chronic, rates of absenteeism and chronic absenteeism. We've brainstormed or talked about why kids are absent, both what you all thought and both in terms of the data. And we've sort of laid out both the short and long-term consequences of missing school. I want now for us to take a moment to brainstorm some solutions, right? How can we address this crisis that exists across this country with respect to chronic absenteeism? How can we get children and uh, how can we re address the barriers that prevent children and families from showing up every day? I, I don't, I'm not going to give you all a very specific focus. I'm not going to say you have to focus on the school or at the community level or at the individual child level. I want you all to think creatively. You all are going to be in smaller groups uh, of about eight uh, in each group, six to eight individuals in each group. And what I want you all to think about, it, it, you can think outside of the box. You can think as creatively as you want, right? You can think about prevention and intervention strategies that target individual children. It could be a community thing. It could be a school thing, right? 
It could be a combination of things. So we're going to break out into smaller groups. I will pop in to your groups just to sort of listen in. I, I'm not there to interfere. I'm just more so curious what folks are going to be talking about. So I'll be just taking a back seat. Uh, we'll do these small groups for, you know, uh, about 10 to 12 minutes, and then we'll circle back. And then I'll be curious if, you know, if an individual, I know we won't have time for all groups to sort of give us a brief synopsis of what was discussed, uh, but it'll be great if at least um, an individual from different groups can give us like a 30 second synopsis of this is kind of what our group was thinking about and seeing whether there is synergy among the different groups in terms of what you all are strategizing. And again, I want to emphasize there's not a right or wrong answer. And, you know, I want you all to be as creative as possible um, in recognition of the fact that this has been an ongoing issue and it's going to require create a creative, it's going to require creativity to, to make a dent into these rates of chronic absenteeism. So, uh, we'll, we'll jump into the smaller, uh, smaller groups. And when there's about 60 seconds remaining, there'll be a um, pop up in your rooms that will say you have 60 seconds and you'll be drawn back into the main room for uh, continuing our conversation. So with that said, let's jump on into the smaller groups. All right. I think folks, most folks have trickled back in. Um, I know we have about 10 minutes left, but I, I was able to stop by uh, a few of the rooms and really enjoyed uh, the, the conversations uh, I was hearing. Um, I, I want to give folks, uh, you know, you know, in 20 to 30 seconds, if there are any group representatives that wanted to sort of throw out like the, the main themes that were emerging um, and, and share it with the, the larger group. Any takers? Okay. I'll go. Um, can you hear me? Yes, I can, can hear you. Hear me? Okay, sorry. Um, one of the things that we, well, we have to talk about a lot of things that really made me excited, but uh, one of the things that we talked about was even transportation. Um, Cause sometimes kids will get sick and you'll hear the parents say, well, I have no way to get them home. Um, so just, just reversing that and maybe having someone who was able to go even pick the kid up. So just even something as small as uh, transportation. So that's one of the things. Another thing um, that we talked about is incentives. Um, last year, we did just with the elementary level popsicles. And I've seen classes go from 64% to 100% just so they could win this prize. Um, so... That was another thing in definitive. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, those are um, those are those are excellent points. And as I'm curious if, uh, if other groups came had similar ideas, different ideas. It looks like Brenda posted some something in okay. the chat, maybe from their group. Okay, let's see. I can open up the chat. So we're seeing um, transportation can be an issue. Um, getting parents, sort of engaging families uh, around the importance of early school attendance. Um, flexibility around some of these topics, short, the, the school times uh, and in terms of different content areas, really interesting points. Anybody else? Thank you for sharing. Uh, I believe it was Brenda. Thank you. Um, our, our group talked about uh, not parent engagement as well as student engagement. If the kids are not engaged and don't have an interest of coming back, but also if the parents don't feel like it's uh, important or that they're part of the team, so making sure everybody feels welcome we also talked about flipping it that the older kids go later in the day instead of earlier. And also um, what, someone in our group talked about that there's like a flexible school that they go for a short amount of time, get direct instruction. It's not an all day thing. And then they have wraparound services that include mental health, which was one of our 
number one focuses of why kids may be absent. And they focus on, you know, what a student individually needs. And they, she said that was in Columbus. So that was our group. Thank you for sharing. Those are those are all excellent points. And um, yeah, the mental health point is, is, is critical. And um, it, it's something we need to, both the mental health and the feelings of belongingness and the welcome, uh, feeling welcome to be at school are, are critical. I see um, Michelle wrote with respect to preschool full day options, which are um, oftentimes limited and potty training. And then Margaret added in um, the school suspensions, uh, which can impact uh, chronic absenteeism. And that is a very serious issue um, with respect to uh, this topic. And it's one that's oftentimes not recognized. When we think of chronic absenteeism, we forget that that is a part of uh, being chronically absent. So thinking about uh, other strategies of uh, addressing these issues are, are key. Um, and Ryan, I see that's uh, another point around the, the school suspensions. Um, those are all fantastic points. Uh, and, you know, if you have other ideas, feel free to throw them in the chat. And I know there were other points in the chat. Uh, there was one in particular that I wanted to address that I would, I'm not going to be able to get to all of them, but there's one point earlier in the chat before we went out to breakout rooms that I think is really important. Uh, which is, you know, uh, chronic absenteeism is an issue. We might be able to lower it, the lower the numbers, uh, but some kids are going to continue to be chronically absent. And so it's critical that we think about strategies that also help those children, right? If they're chronically absent, how can we help them catch up? And so I saw somebody raise a point to that effect, and I just wanted to echo that is a, that is a very important point, and it's something that we need to be thinking about far more carefully um, as, especially as researchers, that's not something that has uh, often been talked about. Um, and then there was another comment about why aren't these questions being asked? Why is the data not being collected? That is, that is, uh, that is also a fantastic question. And it just comes down to, you know, the costs and data availability and data sharing issues, uh, among other things. But those are some things that come to mind. Um, I know we're limited on time. Uh, I just wanted to share uh, a, a few more slides with you all uh, before we wrap up. And so this is, so you all shared your ideas. Um, I wanted to share a resource with you all. Uh, it's known as the Attendance Playbook from 2023, uh, which includes some different strategies that districts have taken or researchers have tested that have shown to help address this issue. Do any one of these things change the chronic absenteeism rate or drop it from, you know, 50% to 30%? No, but they each might be part of the puzzle. And so two of the pieces were mentioned on this call a, a few moments ago, uh, transportation and meals. Uh, we need to meet children's basic needs. Uh, and then other things like mailing outreaches and text nudges also have been shown to work. So for example, uh, the idea is as parents were oftentimes, including myself, not great at remembering how frequently our kids were absent from school. So if you ask me, how often was my toddler absent from school last year? I honestly could not tell you between sicknesses, family visiting and all that, it just adds up, right? So I would not remember. And so part of the idea behind this communication is getting parents accurate and up-to-date information and embedding sort of uh, counterfactuals or comparing your child's rate of absenteeism with other kids in school and or, you know, other kids in their classroom as sort of a point of, um, increasing the motivation, uh, and that has been shown to work. Again, none of these things individually will work, but as a, we'll put it, we'll minimize the rates to the extent that we need, but each, as a, as a collective, it is getting us in the right direction. So it requires an all-hands-on-deck approach, and what I want to say is you all are more than welcome to reach out and communicate and let me know what you're thinking, because it is going to require each of our voices to sort of make a difference. So, the final take-home message is early school absences matter. They're one of the most important indicators for school success. There is a variety of reasons why children are absent. There's not just one reason, as you all have so mentioned. But starting early might be a promising start. Getting children into the right habits can make a difference. And despite some misconceptions about early school absences uh, potentially not being as important, it undermines the advantages of education and has far-reaching consequences for our youngest learners. Um, so I'll stop there. I know we're almost out of time, um, but if you have questions, if, if we're, I, if, if you all are, if you have questions, you can throw it in the chat. Um, you can reach out to me via email. Um, I'm at A-N-S-A-R-I 
.81 at osu.edu. Um, happy to answer any questions and happy to hear your thoughts because we're engaging with different districts around this topic and are addressing this chronic absenteeism. So if you have ideas you would like to share um, to sort of inform our work, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, but again, thank you all for your time. Appreciate this opportunity to have this conversation with you all. And I also wanted to thank you, Arya, for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. Um, please join me in thanking him in the chat and there will now be a 30 minute break. Um, if this is your final session, we have a survey we'd like you to fill out, but only fill it out after your final session of the day. And also um, you can keep the conversation going on Twitter using our hashtag OH Summit 23. And um, also you can go to our summit website for the rest of the day's events. Um, the next sessions will be starting at 12 o'clock, so thank you.